my dog got it. okay got it well welcome 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 or i should say welcome <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's our 99th week of the Native Wellness Institute uh, Power Hour uh, during this um, wave of healing with the pandemic and transforming and realizing our new inner strengths and viewing other people's inner strengths. And so we welcome you. Um, it's a special day um, or we honor all 12 months as Black History Month. <laughs> we yes. honor all 12 months as Native American History Month. <laughs> yes. But it just so happens America is honoring February as Black History Month. So Native Wellness Institute, we gathered um, our knowledgeable indigenous uh, around. So we, we had to get Mark on here. <laughs> so, so we gathered because today we just want to plant the seed. We want to plant the seed for what is healing around Black Indians? What is the history and the next, you know, next gener, gener, 10 generations, we say, 10 behind us and 10 generations coming? What are the, some of the healing things that we should pay attention to? And how should we use the culture and how should we use our indigenous knowledge? And so, um, Nistu Makoyo Sokoyi um, is my Blackfoot name. I'm Theta Nubres, and I'm just one of the team of Native Wellness Institute. Um, I guess I'm kind of like the old lady that lives in the woods, eh? <laughs> so watch out. No. <laughs> anyway, we have a guest, and um, we're going to hear um, from him and uh, uh, allying with him for, for many decades here, just around thinking um, not only about Black Indians, but many epigenetic phenomena, many historical phenomena. And um, I would call, I would kind of call you and me the ancient aliens. Yes. <laughs> the ancient aliens <laughs> put me <in> mark here. <laughs> the, the ancient aliens put me a mark here to stir it up. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway um i'd like uh for all of you please um it's an honor to introduce my brother mark harris so so mark tell him who you are <laughs> ali tell y'all um i'm mark harris um son of hiawatha and louise um our bloodlines and this is usually how i ask um, the, the race question uh, of clients. I'm a therapist, uh, 50 years paid experience in the field, semi-retired the substance use addiction field, as well as cultural, cultural recovery. Um, and, you know, on the Black side, um, we were four generate, I was raised with the awareness of being um, four generations, three generations of sharecroppers and four generations out of slavery. And then on the native side, all eight of my great grandparents were at least half Choctaw. I have a grandfather on the Friedman Rolls, the Choctaw Friedman Rolls, um, George Washington, which apparently, weirdly, uh, with the Dawes and putting Dawes Rolls and putting people in the darky tent, even if you were full native and you were too dark, they put you in the darky tent. So many of our, in terms of our history, if you're going to escape slavery, you're gonna escape into Indian country where you would be accepted and you know, basically live. But then we, at some point, uh, our family uh, along with others made the decision, huh, Ku Klux Klan, or U.S. Cavalry, uh, which one are we gonna go with? Okay, we're gonna go into the cities in all black towns cause we're urban folks. Yeah, we do complex multiracial urban civilizations for thousands of years. And so 
as identifying as a, a Maroon, which is the Taino word for a first generation African native mix. Maroon in the Taino language means wild and free. So we free slaves. Uh, so the Maroons of Jamaica, for example, uh, would raid slave plantations and escape into uh, the mountains. And if the British followed, they got wiped out. And if Massa got in the way, we wiped Massa out. So from a position of strength, uh, basically negotiated a treaty in the 1700s where the Maroons of Jamaica could go anywhere they wanted. Uh, and they could sue the planters in court, but the planters couldn't follow them into uh, the mountains. And those treaties held till today. But the problem is with treaties, as we know in Indian country, if the treaty is between a nation state and not a multinational corporation, it has no effect because the multinational corporation which comes into your land to mine bauxite for aluminum cans can do that because a corporate person cannot necessarily be attacked in the same way. So when we talk about tactics of battle, um, Maroons basically combine uh, the cultural frameworks of Africa, Turtle Island, and knowledge of Europeans since before Europeans got here. So when I think about uh, what a black Indian healing tradition would be, I think about role models like Frederick Douglass, who basically said, yeah, I can escape slavery, but I'm drunk. So we cannot stagger our way to freedom. So mm -hmm. part of the freedom has to be liberation from addiction, just like a uh, handsome lake of six nations uh, started the movement of uh, Code of Handsome Lake, which became evolved into Wellbriety Movement. So those recovery frameworks are centuries old, way older than the white 12-step movement, uh, which, doesn't which doesn't examine its own racism or sexism or cultural dislocation or cultural genocide, because a lot of white people experienced the same thing that natives did. For example, the Irish and the Scots experienced the same attack and genocide from the English speakers and were basically shipped off to Turtle Island and the West Indies as slaves, and then were used as overseers of black people in slavery too. So, you know, healed people, heal people, hurt people, hurt people, recovered people recover, but part of that recovery has to be, oh, knowledge of what came before, what is happening now, and what will keep happening in the future if you don't watch out. Um, so part of what I understood, because I grew up in Los Angeles, um, and you know, born in San Francisco, raised in uh, Los Angeles, and which, you know, LA was one of the largest concentrations of native peoples on the planet, but not necessarily a reservation. Uh, I may know, you know, understand, you know, the word ghetto, but the original reference to ghetto, if we explore that, it's an island that people were sent to die because they rebelled against the system. Mm. All right. So if you understand that, yeah, <laughs> you're sent to, you're basically find in an area to die, be de deprived of resources and still you thrive or actually the strongest of you survive and leave those people to, you know, evolve and strengthen themselves. So I was taught to read at an early age and that's part of your freedom, literacy and understanding your history as well as the science um, and keep, keep developing the science, which could be music, it could be uh, talking, singing, praying, 
staying centered and moving forward. Mm -hmm. So, so Mark, um, tell us a little bit about your migration. <laughs> Just like in fact, uh, the yes, most recent. <laughs> well, you know, I I think that's important because during the pandemic, pandemic, a lot of us have transformed, and a uh, healing matter is we've decided to live in different places. Yes. We've decided to live in different atmospheres. We've decided to. Um, sell houses we've decided to buy houses we've decided um i have some relatives just moved out in the woods and they ain't coming back you know? yes <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just, hey, so so please in your introduction you know so tell us about um why you chose to move where there's more people of color <laughs> that kind of answers itself but no but uh, <laughs> i was I moved to Oregon from Los Angeles nearly 40 years ago because in Los Angeles I was working as a drug counselor for gangs and it's getting yeah because I remember living in South Central before the gangs existed and so <laughs> LAPD heavily recruited from the Ku Klux Klan and was basically doing George Floyd numbers, except it's not George Floyd. There's, I can give you a list of 30 people way before George Floyd that weren't on video. Rodney King's that weren't on video. That was the standard operating procedure of many police forces. And growing up in Los Angeles and our response was the US organization and Kwanzaa and Kawaida the Black Panthers and their 65 survival programs out of Oakland and Los Angeles. So the OSA organization was down the street, 48th Street, because we lived at 48th and Dinker. And let's see, uh, the Panther office was around the corner on Western. So I grew up and remembered that the gangs themselves grew out of the destruction of the Black Panthers because what was happening with the Panthers is our communities uh, were being flooded with drugs mm -hmm. and liquor stores uh, and people were getting, getting killed. And so, you know, education, free breakfast programs, drug treatment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And mm -hmm. uh, those were destroyed deliberately. Mm -hmm. uh, so why do you help you know stop a free drug heroin detox program and arrest the leaders and put them in prison why do you do that because you want the heroin again the alcohol and all those other kinds of things so uh many of the gang members like uh bunchy carter for example use the malcolm x playbook that is you have a book club where you read a book a week and write a book report about uh, about it and then continue right and so bunchy was killed by shall we say agents of the intelligence u.s intelligence community because they were meeting at ucla to start a black studies program to talk about history and bunchy was very you know so they target people who are intelligent non-violent and basically doing progressive work. So understand that sometimes this work, um, like Crazy Horse being stabbed in the back or Geronimo being captured, if you're a peacekeeper, you're a target. So if you're choosing to live in a healing way, that could make you a target. Not talking about paranoia, just talking about this is reality, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I was working gangs because I remember <laughs> there weren't any gangs. And so how do you then turn someone uh, into a more productive life? You know, and I asked the question, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? And I asked that of um, a 16 year old black female, both parents were junkies. Mom died of an overdose and 911 didn't come when they called her. Mm called them right so that's a lesson and then in venice high school a high school counselor said 
you might as well drop out and get on welfare because you're never going to graduate high school. So hmm, strike one, strike two by the system. So she joined uh, the West Side Crips and then started selling water, which is liquid PCP and you know, super cools and the organization. And so in 1982, she was making $10,000 a month, uh, had a fly apart apartment on uh, San Vicente 90210, Cadillac Via Ritz paid for cash, no license. Uh, twice a month would travel to Vegas to buy liquid PCP from the mafia and make super cools and then had two LAPD sergeants on the take. So yeah, cost of doing business and that's an interesting civics lesson too. So, you know, um, and so I asked her the question, um, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? And she said, I'd either become a lawyer or I'd become a counselor to deal with kids like me. Well, in order to do that, you have to, you know, lay out this path and you have to not necessarily depend on the school to give you the education you need. So if you want to be a lawyer, then there's Constance Baker Motley. Who's that? Oh, well, that's the highest federal black female federal judge, Brown versus Board of Education, and a whole history. Uh, in herself, in terms of um, being a lawyer, Johnny Cochran, you know, if you needed that kind of role model, uh, but, you know, understanding the law, which means that you're going to have to do 18 years worth of education, mm -hmm. and you dropped out in 10th grade, so you can do it, there are people that are doing it, but the goal has to be strong enough. So that project, the goal was working, the project was working and it got defunded. And the cover story at the time was uh, the MX missile was uh, on the Congress congressional floor during the Reagan era. So the money that held our anti-gang uh, drug prevention project went away. But it turned out, of course, uh, we know in hindsight, but we suspected at the time, uh, Oliver North needed the gangs to distribute cocaine. So I left LA uh, six months before crack hit when they ended my project and I moved to Oregon. The city, the state of Oregon is a perfect place to study institutional racism from the inside where black people were actually illegal. Black American citizens could be subject to arrest and deported if they migrated to Oregon from other states in the United States. And so every city in Oregon follows that history. And I lived mostly in Eugene, Oregon, where black people were not allowed to live within the city limits until 1968. Woo, woo. Now let's just let's just let's just pause. <laughs> I gotta like swallow that history right now, and I, I'm yeah. to, and I'm inviting our audience. We're talking about the healing of Black Indians, so swallowing that history just up in Oregon. What happened after that? So what happened after that is the first population, of course, was native, right? And there are black people that lived among the natives uh, and lived like black Indians, meaning they led wagon trains with the white folks, but they were able to trade with the Snake and Comanche and all the tribes and all the nations speaking the languages, uh, both English and all the native languages and you know, going to rescue stranded white people in the desert who took a wrong turn because they didn't want to have be guided by a black man. So a black man actually rescues them, right? And he was given a special dispensation, right? But then all the native people, you know, all were moved out to reservations. And even though Oregon says, we don't want black people because we don't want slavery. <laughs> yeah, they decided to enslave native people to build some of their towns. Mm -hmm. during a pandemic 
force marching them in the dead of winter while they have the common cold and tuberculosis and flu uh, to build the sound town of Yahats. So tons of suffering and pain. And then boom, I move there and I go, I've never lived in a place that didn't have intact communities of color. In fact, if there's no intact communities of color, that means they acted to get rid of them. So that's why I'm saying perfect learning laboratory to understand institutional racism from the inside. So whether it's the school district, whether it's the University of Oregon, uh, whether it's the Ku Klux Klan operating to this day and its offshoots to this day in Oregon and various movements and things like that. So lived and taught, worked the alcohol and drug field, worked the education field, um, met uh, all our compadres working at the federal drug prevention level designing trainings like the GONA and the IM and all those kinds of things in the early uh, 90s. And we essentially got priced out of the local housing market, bought a house, sold the house, and uh, we were basically going to use the proceeds to buy a house and we essentially got priced out. And so we started looking as far away as Albuquerque because we had spent some time uh, in New Mexico. And so I got to say, my first impression where, you know, getting up in the morning, there's a lot of light. And even though it was 19 degrees, it was sunny, clear sky, right? So immediately lifting my spirits and moving to a place where there's 1% Black people in the state and 1%, like 1,500 maybe 2000 black people in Eugene, Oregon, moving to a state or a city that's like 65% people of color, 5% black. <laughs> yeah, I listen to okay, NPR. Wait, wait, wait. We're all gonna move to Albuquerque now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we also just heard that it's like the you know one in the top 10 in terms of crime, but okay, you know, but whatever. Um, you know, driving in Science Friday, her Dr. David Satcher, who I've met, you know, like three times once as a little kid, because he said, yeah, I remember you running around at these conferences. And the next time I met him, you know, was he was head of CDC in like the early 90s. And uh, now he has, you know, has his new institute is talking about political determinants of health, not just social determinants of health, political determinants of health. And he was on Science Friday, last Friday, right? And then following that at six o'clock, there was Afropop Worldwide with Fela doing Night in Tunisia. And then right after that, Alternative Radio talking about Malcolm X and the uh, Ballad of the Bullet speech, and then Latino USA, and then overnight, Native American music shows like okay i'm like this okay is, okay yeah. so, <laughs> no, so we would um you know when you're in diversity and you're in a um a state that um, has tribes who are in sovereignty yes not, right. not only they live on their land they teach their creation story. They have immersion schools that teaches the language. They have um, treatment programs in the culture. They have, you know, I could go on and on that that's, um, that's kind of like, um, isn't that what the ancient alien sent us here to do? No. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if we've been living here long enough that we not aliens no more, no matter where we came from. Now we yeah. indigenous. I mean, how many generations do you have to be living on planet Earth or, you know, Turtle Island? I mean, well, yeah. Um, well, I wanted to um, I wanted to share um, just a small uh, not not a small story, but a story of of healing with black Indians and 
in my family. And so I just want to share the story and then I'd like any of your thoughts or, you know, anyone watching just comments and, and I, um, the reason I'm sharing it, because, you know, I'm kind of, when I was waking up this morning, during this pandemic has been um, a blessing because of the quietness, because of the serenity and dreaming. So when I was waking up this morning, I was dreaming about um, a grandson, a grandson named T.C. Okro. And um, I was thinking about T.C. when he was, uh, you know, graduated from Head Start. And I was thinking about when he, he started to grow and uh, he spent summers um, with me and my um, uh, Amanda Old Crow who I adopted when she was 14. And then his, um, his sister, Jamie. And, um, but, um, I, and so I wanted to just, and I, I thought, man, this is almost like an epigenetic thing. Cause when he was young, we would always take him to the Sundance. Um, we were Sundancers with Buster Yellow Kidney. Buster was um, one of our longtime elders. He was also a policeman. You know, a lot of our, um, our we, we come from a warrior tribe. A lot of our men, it's natural because all of our societies and all of our, our caretakers in our society, it's all about um, helping the people and protecting the people, which is what police are supposed to do. Yeah. And so um, Buster, so anyway, TC would always come up and, and um, we'd, um, rough it you know because it was you know we were dancing and there was the camp and um we would do the prayers and so he learned all those protocols of respect but then after we were done buster yellow kidney used to always tell us to um okay you know when you're done you you, you know you go through protocols of sweating or you you have to do things to come back to yourself and yes. it's almost to be in to ground state. we would say in counseling counselors speak ah uh, yeah so 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 tc was always there and and so i became aware that his grandpa was african-american mm. and so and you know and he's upsalaga crow and then yeah. because i'm his kala his blackfeet kala i was i just knew that i had to teach him the best I could all of those <laughs> and so that's that's the healing of a grandma when you have a grandchild that is a black Indian and so so one of just the 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 story I'd like to tell and I um I gave um a Shailene Joseph who is part of our indigenous 20 something and is our technical person I gave her a picture uh, uh would you mind putting that up Shailene just of, of TC and I'll ah, just uh, I can see that. OK. Yeah. And so this is um, this is one that we just st we'd stay up there till we came back to ourselves and he just loved it. But um, I just I love raising boys. They're different than raising girls, of course. But um, I just I gave him a sharp knife <laughs> and I pointed towards towards several trees and willows and I said, well, okay, well, here's your first lesson, you know, about living in the wild. You're the man, you know, because there was Grandma Betty and Matt. We're just recovering from sun dancing. And I said, so if we didn't have nothing, if we didn't have that baloney over there. <laughs> if we didn't have nothing, TC, what would you do as the man to feed us and take care of us? So he said, okay, Grandma. You know, okay, Grandma. He said, um, I would give me that knife. And so he, what he did was, and this is no one, he didn't Google it. And when, there ain't no Wi Fi, nothing works up there. You're just in the woods. <laughs> and he took that knife and he found a branch and he made himself a spear. He sharpened it, he made himself a spear. And it was days on end, he would just dive and he was learning how to spear a fish because he was going to feed grandma betty <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, and you know this is this is just like the pc there's just so many the other i would just um 
he, I thought it was epigenetics because he was just like, and I don't, I don't know if it was coming from his African American side or from his Indian side, but he was just he fit in the woods and he as a boy just wanted to be that warrior. And I just um, so I just wanted to share that that short story, you know, um, of TC and 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 again, you know, he hung around me till about the eighth grade, and then he went on to um, other chapters of his life. And I'm speaking about him today because I was dreaming of him this morning and I, I just needed to acknowledge him. And because I still love him, he's not here on earth anymore. And March 7th will be the anniversary in which he was shot and killed in Billings, Montana. And they still haven't arrested the person who did it. So, and that may be rolling around, but I just want to, in Mark, and part of the healing is around this social justice. Yes. Part of the healing is, um, you know, TC was destined to be so many things. TC was so intelligent. TC was so smart. TC was just generous. He had all of those talents, but he ended up, you know, selling drugs and getting mixed with the wrong mix, and he ended up being murdered, you know, and so as a grandma, and I want to acknowledge his other grandma, his other Kala, Janice, good luck, and his other grandmas, you know, there's many grandmas. Cause you know, you know, when you're Indian, you have a whole bunch of grandmas. Right. right. <laughs> so I just wanted to um, acknowledge um, the other Kalas and we're all still healing from, from, from that. Yeah. From, from that we're still grieving. And, and so I continually, I will continue to work on that. So I just wanted to tell you the real story of who TC Olcro is, because that's who he really was. He was not a criminal. He was not these other things that society would put him as. He, he was my grandson. And I still love him and I still miss him. So I, uh, these tears are of um, healing. That's not what they are, Mark. And so um, yes. thank, you, thank you, Shailene. And if you look at TC, just look at, you know, <laughs> he, was, he was so damn handsome. <laughs> <laughs> He was just handsome, you know, and, and you know, black Indians are handsome. <laughs> <laughs> so, can, Mark, can you, you know? Yes, I can. That story. I can. You know. It, many of us, um, the word in English is rites of passage. Mm -hmm. So one of the gifts I was able to bring to Eugene even though there's no intact black community was to basically bring the idea of let's have an ethnic studies program where we're talking about the history. And I start in 17,000 BC. Wow. Not okay. 1619, 17,000 BC. And the reason I do that is because uh, one of my, uh, colleagues, I guess, also he qualifies as a mentor, uh, Anthony Browder, Tony Browder basically says, um, look, human history, humans have been around uh, for 300,000 years. And so if you think of 300,000 years as a book of a thousand pages, 300 years to a page, then the standard black history treatment of starting in 1619 is like starting your history on page 996 of a thousand page book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so wrong. <laughs> so even the history of black Indians, okay, is going to start you know, considerably before that, we like in the early 900s, right? 
So when we're talking 17,000 years ago, so before the pyramids, what kind of society was necessary to create period, pyramids without space aliens? Just let's, let's imagine that, all right? And not only pyramids in Africa, but pyramids in Turtle Island, and that there was a trade relationship going between all the pyramid builders, which included the Chinese, which included the Native Americans, Aztecs, Olmecs, Maya, et cetera, et cetera. There's a trading relationship because if you can build a pyramid, you can also build a transplanet sailing vessel. And if you can invent one, you can invent fleets. So fleets of transatlantic sailing vessels traveled from Africa before Columbus, before Europe was in the dark ages. <laughs> so let, let's start there. So when we talk about black Indians, I'm saying 3000 year history, not 1619, 3000. So let's, let's start there. Let's talk about role models that are successful. Frederick Douglass. So one third of black America has native blood, has lived with natives and contribute to societies as free people, as well as the entire mix. So many of us as part of our rites of passage transition pass through criminality, Michael, uh, Malcolm X did. Lots, you know, the Black Panthers were actually started from gangs that were organized for self-defense because if LAPD is recruiting from the Klan and there are white supremacist gangs that don't like the fact that black people are moving into neighborhood, for example, in Los Angeles, moving across west of Central Avenue. That's why you have South Central, right? So you're moving into formerly white neighborhoods and they're being attacked with police aid, right? White supremacist gangs, the skinheads of their day. Who's organizing against that? So the Slossons, the businessmen, et cetera, et cetera. And those became the working core of what became the Black Panthers because they understood, no, we're not gonna be criminals. We're going to organize to help the community. We're gonna educate ourselves to you know, help the community. Bobby Seale and Huey Newton, when they started the Black Panthers in Oakland, both had college degrees. Mm -hmm. Right. So when we're talking about, you know, lots of black professionals organizing for health care, for a free breakfast program, for all the thing, the 65 survival programs that are listed on that Stanford website. That's where that came from. That's why they were attacked. Any liberation movement of people of color has been attacked, often violently, by the United States. Mm -hmm and gotten rid of or attempted to get rid of it. So that's part of you know, freedom. The price of freedom is, yeah. Hi, there's, a re there, there's a reason why native nations were attacked because they welcomed and included diversity. They recognized at least seven different gender expressions. They incorporated women as part of their political expression. Black women were running the country and selecting chiefs and could unmake chiefs if you didn't act right, right? So that was the basis of indigenous democracy and also African democracy, where you had equality between all the different gender expressions. So seven kinds of gender expressions among the Osage, 12 kinds of marriage, uh, among the Fawn of Dahomey, which is one of the places in West Africa where they fielded all women combat troops to use against Europeans. But at the same time, they also use those all women combat troops to capture slaves to sell to the Europeans. So we gotta be honest about that and part of, that's part of the healing. So when we talk about Black Indians, and it's like Frederick Douglass and Malcolm X and Tina Turner and Jimi Hendrix and Jesse Jackson. And yeah, we can go on the list in terms of 
who is going to be your role model? Because if you're smart and you're intelligent, part of racial self-hatred is you're not being told about your potential greatness and what you can do with those smarts. Because what happened with, I will call her Kathy, the gang member that I was talking about, she was in, how, how many teachers could integrate an income of $10,000 a month, which was at the time more than I was making in a year? $10,000 a month. What do you do with that kind of income? You can't put it in a bank, right? So she said, I wanted the American dream and I didn't expect to live past 18. So I wanted as much as possible. Nobody, you're the first person that told me that I could make it and that there was a path to making it. And it wasn't through drugs and wasn't through gangs. So part of that rites of passage where there are elements of it that are repl replicated within the gang and criminal life. That is tests of strength, agility, and life and death. Can you overcome death, right? But not necessarily how to have a life that's just not oriented towards making money because it's more to life than making money. How are you healing the people? So when we talk about Navajo Crips and Bloods, Tongan Crips and Bloods, like, wait, that's happening outside of an urban context where Crips and Bloods came from. And Crips and Bloods actually were, respectively, Black Panthers and the US organization that got corrupted by prison and then became criminal street gangs because they couldn't get a job. Mm -hmm. But if you start with that, context, whether it's the res or whatever, and you're not educated to how you can be productive in society beyond money, how you can contribute to the health of your society through wisdom and your traditional wisdom, which you're not being taught because, oh, that's critical race theory. Uh, no, that's not ethnic studies or critical race theory. That's teaching you to be human in a way that's older than America, mm -hmm. because Mark, when you Mark, go ahead, um, go ahead. I don't want to, um, I know how then I get. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just thinking, um, I would like you to comment, you know, and finish, finish that history. We got, we got about another 15 minutes here on the power hour. And this is um, uh, historical. Yeah. Because I was just like, even today, the social justice that will come down for George Floyd. Yes. Even today, the conversations around America, even today in Montana, the conversations. But, you know, in our area here, uh, Alberta, I just saw in, and, you know, social media is a lot of what uh, during the pandemic we see. I saw a picture of, and his name was Dave, I, I think Dave Wells. He was an African-American man that um, had four blood wives, Kainai, mm. and he had children by all of them. And then I think of um, one of my great uncles, his name was Floyd Green, and uh, he was African-American, but as a child, uh, all of our full bloods were really dark. So I just thought he was a dark black thing. <laughs> so, so, you know, we don't, it's about color of skin, you know, color of yes, skin. Right. And, and then I think about all of, um, cause he has, you know, um, hundreds of, of grandchildren and great grandchildren and great, great grandchildren. And we just, um, we put one of our elders to um, uh, celebration of life and put her to rest at 95. And that was, she had three husbands and one of her husbands was this African-American man. And so I just look at, so I just think, sheesh, you know, there's a lot of healing because a healing in the sense and celebration, because I see those relatives. And then I, I see, you know, I, I was sitting in a church and half the hair is kinky. You know? <laughs> and I, but I was just looking at how they were thriving. I was just looking at how, um, 
you know, the, how, the, how advanced the, these little kids and these teenagers, because they were half black and they were half Indian, and they were maneuvering and they were conquering the world. And yes. they were coming out and they were thriving. As long as they don't drink or use drugs or fentanyl. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. that's, but, but again, uh, I'll just say this and then I want you to kind of like um, close us out in some thoughts is, you know, the colonization process with the tribe is you know it's a formula take away mm -hmm. how they take away how they pray disenfranchise their men and lock them up take away their language take away their lang land base take their children and then you just add a drug a little yes. bit of fentanyl opioid right. boom right. Gen right. Genesis. so native wellness institute we're reversing that you know we're we're, we're taking each one off and we're healing that. So in, in our remaining time, what, what points or what can we share with our audience? Where do we begin to heal around black Indians? Well, first <laughs> of all, let's dispense with the blood quantum thing. Okay. Cause that's being used as a weapon. And when we enslaved white people, I'm talking about the Moors, what we needed to do was teach them, we needed literate slaves and numerate slaves. So we taught them how to breed quarter horses out of the purebred Arabian war horses, which we kept for ourselves. But we were going to sell the quarter horses to export. But if you don't have a concept, you don't read, and you don't have a concept of number, how do you make a quarter horse when you don't know what a quarter is? Okay, so that concept was applied to horse breeding, not to human beings in Africa, because there's no point in counting after half. Nobody counts after half. Nobody defines on skin color because genetic variation and epigenetic variation, you can be any color at all, including albino, right? Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Europeans took that concept and decided to apply it to people of color as a weapon of war, right? And so, and you know, right? Because why? Why is it that you're nat you're not native after one eighth, one sixteenth, but you're still black if you're one sixty fourth? Oh, you're not Hawaiian after one half. Okay, why is not applied to white people? When do you stop being white? Notice that how the game is working. It's a weapon okay, of identity, right? Okay. So psychological warfare. So that's where you have to understand where that came from. So stop how they pray, stop their language. Pills are not skills. We both had extensive pharmacologies okay 800 on the native side at least that many on the chinese and african side from different medicinal plants all right so yes we had psychoactives but psychoactives were basically used to teach you balance just like having medicine you don't use peyote every day you use it for the healing of others not personal use Okay, and you're not doing a medicine circle TP meeting every day, right? So it's like a training wheel for life to show you a different intersecting reality and then develop the skills to be in balance in life. So pills are not skills, but they use that. pills as a weapon to destroy you. So you have to understand when did fentanyl become a substitute for milk sugar in heroin. Who did that, right? How did South Central get 750 liquor stores at the time of the rebellion? And I'm not talking about the LA Rodney King riots. I'm calling it the rebellion because rebellions are planned. And basically understanding that, huh, if you're legally only supposed to have 250, why do you have 750 liquor stores in that same area? Mm -hmm. That's chemical warfare. Mm -hmm. If it's illegal for natives to drink alcohol before 52, 1952, 
why are reservations flooded with liquor? And why do all, or all the medicine people or anybody that tries to stop it jailed or killed? Okay, chemical warfare, right? Chemical biological warfare. If you also don't teach how to deal with the biological microscopic world, then pandemics come and cold, et cetera, et cetera. So when we're talking about our healing, we need to look at um, a certain scientific literacy that we used to have that we can also still build up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as part of the cover recovery mm -hmm. you know one of the um things um that native wellness is really um like i'm heading to pine ridge with marcus red thunder this coming week to do a um a four-day healing over there one of the things and i just got off with seattle indian health board where they're growing their own sweet grass. They're growing their own tobacco. Um, they got a space where it's like the medicine wheel, mind, body, and spirit. So they're looking at what's good for the physical spirit, what's good for the emotional spirit. So even the plant medicine, the indigenous knowledge, the, um, the medicine of cultural identity, um, the medicine of, like you said, rites of passage, um, the, the medicine of speaking your language, learning it, uh, uh, practicing, you know, just practicing is a tool, is a skill um, of learning that prayer when you're praying. You know, one of, um, you know, one of my, um, I idolize Martin Luther King, but one of, one of his sayings, I mean, I was just thinking, why? Because I remember him saying, he said, oh, I'm just so overwhelmed. He said, I don't know what I would do if I didn't pray at least two hours a day. <laughs> you know? so, then, so then I think about, yes. you know, as older as I'm turning older, I'm just praying most of the day, you know, and yes. most of my duty is people say I need prayers for this. And so I stop and I pray, I stop and I, so, uh, can you speak about some of the wisdom or the yes. resiliency yes. in our in our last 10 minutes of this this power hour? Like where do we gotta go from what do we gotta get wise on? What do we need to do to grow, Mark? Well, you asked me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So the what we call, we need to get to basically the Christian roots that are African, not okay. white colonizer, okay? The oldest book in the world is an Egyptian Bible, the Aramaic Peshitta, which is the language that Christ spoke, mm -hmm. Aramaic. And when you study Aramaic, you get, instead of English, so Aramaic is a working language of mystics who work with the land and the spirit. English is a language of accountants. Huh. So it's about money, right? And so about connection. So Holy Spirit in Aramaic, ruach is breath. Ah. You're filling yourself with the Holy Spirit. Okay, and when you're praying, you're not saying Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You're quiet. You're listening. Mm. Okay, in Apache way, silence isn't a place where there's no sound. Silence is a place you go to hear. Okay, so in that sense, Ruach, Holy Spirit, you deepen your breath. When Yeshua talks about Aheb Labwell Babaku, which is translated into English as love your enemies, in Aramaic, it's instructions on how to do it. You deepen your breath, you slow your breath down till you connect with your heart and you connect with your adversary, your enemy in their heart because you're the same being. They're just out of rhythm with you. So you see into your own heart first. Then you see into their heart where they're stuck. And you unstick yourself. You don't even deal with them. 
Okay. So when Martin talks about praying two hours a day, I mean, he's still talking about an English Western sense, which is not the original sense. So when we're talking about getting into the indigenous Christianity, which is basically coming out of African mysticism, which is also, there's no easy way to say this, okay? There's a sacred feminine. So the first Lord, the first lo line of the Aramaic Lord's prayer is Avun de Boishmaya, birther. You create all that moves in light. Okay, Avun, <laughs> birther. I don't know how the English speakers get our father from birther, because I don't know, biology hasn't really changed in 2000 years. So when you erase the sacred feminine, you get into problems. And part of that, is especially within uh, looking at the Aramaic speakers and the Aramaic sense, sensibilities of Christianity. So not only is the oldest book in the world an Egyptian Bible, the Peshitta, but the place where Christianity has been practiced the longest is Ethiopia, you know, so first century. For a long time, the images of Christ, where's a brown skinned, curly haired, like your grandson, hair, yeah. right? Brown skin, because guess what? You can't spend 40 days and 40 nights in a desert that has 130 degrees in the shade and the shade is a palm tree and not look like and start look, come out looking like Michelangelo's uncle. <laughs> Which is this, you know, the image of Christ on the Sistine Chapel. So, yeah, I am a black liberation theologist. My grandfather, whose father was George Washington you know, basically said, look, Jesus is black. His name's not Jesus. You need to find the name of him. You need to find the word and language he spoke. And I'm eight. So I don't even know Aramaic. I don't know Yeshua. I don't know any of those other things, but I've kind of made it that quest to understand, oh, so it's a meditative, nature-based, feminine, sacred feminine religion spirituality where mm -hmm. he's you know he and mary magdalene had kids because there's no celibacy in the jewish religion which he mm -hmm. wasn't part of because you know he was born uh mary had him at 13 so teen mom and she wouldn't name the dad so that's rape or incest right so all those begats in Luke and Matthew are tracing Elizabeth's line and Elizabeth is Mary's sister and the mother of John the Baptist who he studied with and who the Romans killed. Wow. Hmm. Black wow. Jesus gets killed by white Romans because Jews stone people to death. How do you die? Cross. What's the symbol of original Christianity? The ankh, not the Roman torture device. An ankh, which means the union of male and female and eternal life. And he's not talking about eternal life in one body because he, in Judaism, there's no hell and there's no devil. There is mm. evil, right? Mm. But evil, the word in uh, Aramaic for ripe for good, ripe fruit. Evil, unripe fruit from the same tree. Mm -hmm. And I would vote for that so tree Martin, being a fig so leaf, a fig. We're, we we're got a couple time. More, no, we got a couple more minutes. Good. And, you know, healing starts today. Yes. <laughs> healing starts today. And we appreciate everything that you have shared so far. Um, I'm going to um, give two recommendations for future healing. And then I'd like you to give just a couple, um, end with a couple of recommendations of future healing. I, as a grandmother of many mixed race grandchildren, I think we need to not keep any secrets. 
We need to know the history of all of the blood that runs through our veins. Uh, I was just thinking of one of um, one of my my nephews. That's eight tribes, no white blood, but eight tribes. I think that part of the healing is respecting all the blood that runs through our veins. Yes. And so, and and the second thing is, um, and it, it has to do with um, uh, work in a recovery program, just being clean and sober. Yes, right. Come first. And so that would be mine. So what would be your two things? This is because I know we can go and go. <laughs> what would, a well, of, like if you just grab them, what would they be? Uh, I think I would second the honor your bloodlines uh, because in my bloodlines, you know, there's white people. There is a white slave owner about four generations back. So understand, you know, where, how do I integrate that? And deepen your breath and practice deepening your breath for at least five to 10 minutes a day. And then when you get angry, watch your breath. Don't do a single breath, do 10 in a row. <laughs> because when you do that physiologically, I'm a yoga teacher, a black yoga teacher, an Egyptian yoga teacher, an Aramaic Christian yoga teacher, you deepen your breath and slow it down for 10 minutes and then return to that. Mm. Okay, so there we have it. And this is to be continued. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thank you for the this is the 99th week of native native wellness institutes power hour we come every wednesday um we want to thank you mark from the bottom of our heart and you're in our prayers and so we're we're gonna say kitakito matsuno and it just means see you later we never say goodbye um ah, so, th thank, to, so th thank you so much mark and so, tuta nana in kiswahili means we will see each other again. Shtayu in ancient Chakta means stay strong. Ah, thank you so much. Thank you. I think we can close down, Shailene. <laughs>